Part 2 Chapter 22 If you were the baby buffalo at the Elmwood Park Zoo, maybe it would have gone something like this. You wake up. You have breakfast, compliments of mother's milk. You mosey on over to the lean-to. Surprise! A new animal in there. Bigger than you, but a lot smaller than mom. Hair, but only on the top of its head. Sitting in the straw, munching on a carrot, like mom does. Every morning, same thing. You get to expect it. Some mornings, you forget mom's milk and head right on over to the lean-to. The creature offers you a carrot, but all you know how to deal with is milk. You nuzzle the new, funny-smelling, hairy-headed animal. It nuzzles you back. Mom doesn't seem to mind. After the nuzzling, the stranger climbs over the fence and goes away, not to return until that night. Only, one morning the stranger falls from the fence and lies on the ground on the other side. It doesn't move. You try to poke your nose through the chain links, but you can't reach it. You can only watch. Only watch. The old man was bumping through the zoo in the park pickup when he spotted the body clumped outside the buffalo pen. He wheeled over, got out, a kid! At first he could only stare at the body, then at the baby bison, whose large brown eyes seemed to be watching them both. The mother came lumbering over, nodding as if to confirm, a kid. The kid looked terrible. His clothes were scraps, rags. Wherever his body showed through, it was bony and dirty and scratched. The two bison, staring, staring, seemed to say, Well, do something. The old man gathered his own bones and muscles as best he could and managed to hoist the kid and get him into the pickup. He laid him on the seat, bent his legs so he could close the door. He knew he should take the kid straight to the hospital, or a doctor, someplace official, someplace right. But the pickup just sort of steered itself back to the band shell, and there he was, lugging the kid into the baseball equipment room. The season was over by now, but the army green burlap bag still stood ready for the next ump to call, Play ball! He yanked out a couple of chest protectors and laid the kid down, careful with his head. At least, he was breathing. Though it wasn't cold, it seemed as if the kid ought to be covered. So the old man took his winter work jacket off the hook and laid that over him. Then he waited and watched. With trembling, dusty fingers, he touched the kid's limp, scrawny hand. He'd never held, never really touched a kid's hand before. Hey! The kid's voice was barely a squeak, but it threw him back. He dropped the hand. Where am I? The old man cleared his throat. The band shell. The band shell? In the back. Equipment room. The kid's eyes squinted, blinked. And you? What about me? Who are you? Grayson. Grayson, do I know you? He got up. Guess you do now. He went to his hot plate, heated up some water, and made some chicken noodle cup of soup. He gave it to the kid who was sitting up now. You want a spoon? He looked as though he could hardly lift the cup. He held it with both his hands and gulped it down. Huh? He said. Never mind. You still hungry? The kid flopped back down. A little. Wait here, said Grayson, and left. Ten minutes later, he was back with a zep. A large. It took the kid less time to polish it off than it had taken Grayson to get it. He told the kid not to eat so fast he'd get sick. The kid nodded. Grayson said, Where'd you get them scratches? Oh, some picker bush. What were you doing there? Hiding. Hiding from who? Some kids. Where? The kid pointed. Somewhere out there, some other town. He crossed his legs Indian style on the chest protector. Can I ask you a favor? Shoot. Can we go somewhere and get some butterscotch crimpets? Grayson squawked. Crimpets? You still hungry? For them, I am. Grayson threw the greasy zep wrapper into the waste basket. I don't know. Maybe you ought to do something for me first. Like what? Like, tell me your name. It's Jeffrey McGee. And where do you live? Well, I did live on Sycamore Street, 728. Did? I guess I don't anymore. The old man stared. You said Sycamore? Yep. Ain't that the East End? Yep. With his fingernail, he scratched a patch of dirt off the kid's forearm. Arm. He stared at it. What are you doing? The kid asked. Seeing if he was white under there. Neither spoke for a while. At last, the kid said, Anything else you want to ask me? The old man shrugged. Guess not. Ah, come on, don't stop asking. I'm asked out. How about the zoo, huh? Don't you want to know what I was doing at the zoo? At the buffalo pen? The old man sighed. Okay, what? I was living there. With the buffaloes? Yep, with the buffaloes. You like buffaloes? It was dark when I got there. I thought it was the deer pen. 
They switched the deer and the buffaloes around last month. Okay with me. I got along better with the buffaloes anyway. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the old man sniffed. You sure do smell like one. The kid laughed. They both laughed. When they finally calmed down, the kid said, Any chance of those crimpets now? Grayson reached for the pickup keys. Let's go. Chapter 23 Grayson got the crimpets all right. He bought a whole pa box of three packs. With ten packs to a box, that was thirty butterscotch crimpets. Maniac thought he must have climbed out of the buffalo pen right into heaven. Then Grayson took Maniac home. Home for the old man was the Two Mills YMCA. He lived in a room on the third floor. But he didn't take Maniac up there. He took him downstairs to the locker room. He got him a towel and a cake of soap, told him to take off his rags, and pointed the way to the showers. Maniac stayed in the shower for an hour. He hadn't done this since his last bath with the little ones. He smiled at the thought of them, shrieking and splashing. The shower needles stung his scratches, but it was a good, welcome back to town stinging. When Maniac finally forced himself from the shower, he found the old man waiting with clothes. Grayson's clothes. I called the U.S. Army in to haul them buffalo rags away, he said. They come in with gas masks on, and they use tongs to pick them up and put them in a steel box, and they took the box away to bury it in the bottom of the first mine shaft they'd come to. Maniac couldn't stop laughing. Neither could Grayson, especially when he got a load of the kid drowning in his clothes. An hour later, after a minor shopping spree, Maniac had clothes of his own. For the rest of the afternoon, they cruised around town, talking and eating crimpets. So, said the old man, now what are you going to do? Maniac thought it over. How about a job? I could work for the park like you. Grayson didn't like, didn't answer that. He said, where do you think you're going to stay? Maniac's answer was prompt. The baseball room. It's perfect. A tiny idea was beginning to worm its way into Grayson's head. He could barely feel it as it brushed, as it brushed by all the claptrap in his brain. He ignored it. He said, what about school? Maniac was silent. Some butterscotch icing had stayed behind on a wrapper. He scooped it up and mopped it with his finger, wishing it were Mrs. Beale's and not his own. Grayson, who was not comfortable asking questions, was even less comfortable waiting for answers. I said, what about school? Maniac turned to him. What about it? You gotta go. You're a kid, ain't ya? I'm not going. But you gotta, don't ya? They'll make ya. Not if they don't find me. The old man just looked at him for a while, with a mixture of puzzlement and recognition, as though the fish he had landed might be the same one he had thrown away long before. Why? he said. Maniac felt why more than he knew why. It had to do with homes and families and schools, and how a school seems sort of like a big home, but only a day home, because then it empties out, and you can't stay there at night because it's not really a home, and you can never use it as your address, because an address is where you stay at night, where you walk right in the front door without knocking, where everybody talks to each other and uses the same toaster, so all the other kids would be heading for their homes, their night homes, each of them, hundreds, flocking from school like birds from a tree, scattering across town, each breaking off to his or her own place, each knowing exactly where to land. School? Home? No. He was not going to have one without the other. If you try to make me, he said, I'll just start running. Grayson said nothing. What the kid said actually made him feel good, though he had no idea why and the brushing little worm of a notion was beginning to tickle him now. He kept on driving. Chapter 24 They got back to the band shell just as they finished the last of the crimpets. Grayson looked at his watch. Guess it's time to quit the job I never did today. Time for dinner, too. Grayson was joking, but Maniac was serious when he piped up. Great! Where to? Dumbfounded, the old man drove back out of the park to the nearest diner, where he sat with a cup of coffee while the boy wolfed down meatloaf and gravy, mashed potatoes, zucchini, salad, and coconut custard pie. Grayson had a way of jumping into a subject without warning. It was during Maniac's dessert that he abruptly said, Them black people, they eat mashed potatoes too? Maniac thought he was kidding. Then he realized he wasn't. Sure, Mrs. Beale used to have potatoes a lot, mashed in every other way. Mrs. Who? Mrs. Beale. Do you know the Beals of 728 Sycamore Street? The old man shook his head. Well, they were my family. I had a mother and a father and a little brother and a sister and a sister my age and a dog. My own room, too. Grayson stared out the diner window, as if digesting this information. How about meatloaf? Huh? They eat that, too? Sure, meatloaf, too. And peas and corn, you name it. Cake? Maniac bean beamed. Oh, man, you kidding? Mrs. Beale makes the best cakes in the world. 
Grayson's eyes narrowed. Toothbrushes? They used them? Maniac fought not to smile. Absolutely, we all had our own toothbrushes hanging in the bathroom. I know that, said Grayson, in Grayson impatient, but is theirs the same as ours? No difference that I could see. He didn't drink out of the same glass. Absolutely we did. This information seemed to shock the old man. Maniac laid down his fork. Grayson, they're just regular people like us. I was never in a house of theirs. Well, I'm telling you, it's the same. There's bathtubs and refrigerators and rugs and TVs and beds. Grayson was wagging his head. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? It was after dark when they got back to the baseball equipment room. The worm in Grayson's head had long since ceased to be a tiny tickle. It was now a maddening itch. As with all such itch worms, it would exit by only one route, the mouth. He said, Uh, I was thinking, uh, maybe you want to come over to my place. This here floor's pretty hard. He tapped his foot to show how hard. The grizzled old man couldn't never know how much Maniac was tempted or how deeply the offer touched him. Neither could Maniac explain that the bad luck he always seemed to have with parents had led him to the conclusion that he'd better stick to himself. Oh, it's not so bad here, he said. Look! He laid down on the chest protectors and closed his eyes. Ah, just like a mattress. I can feel myself dozing off already. And then, not wanting to hurt the old man's feelings, he quickly added, Hey, I told you everything about me. How about you? He pulled Grayson's coat over him. A bedtime story. Grayson snorted. Story? I don't know no stories. Sure you do, Maniac prodded. About yourself. You know, about you. Everybody has a story. Not me. Grayson was edging for the door. I ain't got no story. I ain't nobody. I work at the park. You line baseball fields. Yep, I do that. You live at the Y. You drive the park pickup. You like butterscotch crimpets. Grayson shook his head. Not as much as you. I was just eating them to be friendly, so you wouldn't have to eat them all by yourself. And there's another thing about you, Maniac joked. You're a liar. They both laughed. Grayson opened the door. Wait, called Maniac. What did you want to be when you grew up? Or what did you want to grow up to be when you were a kid? Grayson paused in the doorway. He looked out into the night. A baseball player, he said. He turned out the light and closed the door. Chapter 25 in the morning, Grayson brought, bought Maniac an Egg McMuffin and a large orange juice. He bought the same thing for himself, so they ate breakfast together in the baseball equipment room. You sent me to bed without a story last night, Maniac kidded. Grayson brushed a yellow speck of egg from his white stubble. I don't got no stories. I told you. You wanted to be a baseball player. That ain't no story. Well, did you become one? Grayson drank half his orange juice. Just the minors, he muttered. Maniac yelped, the miners? Could never make it to the majors. There was a frayed weariness in the old man's words, as though they had long since worn out. Grayson, the miners? Man, you must have been good. What position did you play? Grayson said, pitcher. This word, unlike the others, was not worn out at all, but fresh and robust. It startled Maniac. It declared, I am not what you see. I am not a line-laying, pick-up-driving, live-at-the-y, bean-brained park-hand. I'm not rickety, whiskered worm chow. I am a pitcher. Maniac had sensed there was something more to the old man. Now he knew what it was. Grayson, what's your first name? The old man fidgeted. Earl, but call me Grayson like everybody. He looked at the clock on the wall. Gotta go. Grayson, wait. I'm late for work. You ought to be in school. He was gone. Grayson returned at noon, bearing zeps and sodas, and was not allowed to leave until he told Maniac one story about the minor leagues. So he told the kid about his first day in the minors, with Bluefield, West Virginia, in the Appalachian League, Class D. Can't go no lower than that, he told the kid. That's where you broke in. Don't have D-ball no more. He told about thumbing a ride to Bluefield and, when he got there, going up to a gas station attendant and asking which way to the ballpark. And the gas station man told him, Sure, but first I gotta ask you something. You're a new ball player, right? Just coming on board? And Grayson said, Yep, that's right. And the man said, I thought so. Well, then, you're going to want to make your first stop right over there. He pointed across the street. That there restaurant, the Blue Star. You just go right on in there, and you sit yourself down, tell the waitress you want the biggest steak on the menu, and anything else you want, too. Because it's all on the house. The Blue Star treats every new rookie to his first meal in town free. He gave him a wink. They want your business. Great, thought Grayson. And he did just that. Only when he got up and left... The restaurant owner came running after him down the street, all mad at Grayson for skipping out. 
And when Grayson told him he was a rookie just picking up his free first meal, the owner got even madder. Seems like the gas station man was a real card and liked to welcome dumb rookies with his little practical joke. And that's how it came to be that when the Bluefield Bullets took the field that day, they did so without the services of their new pitcher, who was back in the kitchen of the Blue Star restaurant, doing dishes to work off a 16-ounce steak, half a broiled chicken, and two pieces of rhubarb pie. After a story like that, Maniac couldn't just stay behind, so he tagged along when Grayson went back to work. He helped the old man raise a new fence around the children's petting farmyard. When the park superintendent came round and asked about the kid, Grayson said it was his nephew come to visit for a while. The superintendent, who managed the budget, said, We can't pay him. You know. And Grayson said, Fine, no problem. And that was that. From then on, Maniac was on the job with Grayson every afternoon. They raised fences, mended fences, hauled stone, patched asphalt, painted, trimmed trees. They ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. Sometimes in the equipment room, sometimes at a restaurant. They spent weekends together. All the while, Grayson told baseball stories, insisting all along, I ain't got no stories. He told about the Appalachian League, and the Carolina League, and the Pecos Valley League, and the Buckeye and the Mexican Leagues, about the Paducah Twin Oaks, and the Nazchez Pelicans, and the Jessup Georgia Browns, and the Laredo Lariats, all minor league teams, minor league baseball, sleazy, sleazy hotels, sleazy buses, sleazy stadiums, sleazy fans, sleazy water buckets, curveballs, and bus fumes, and dreams, dreams of the majors, clean sheets, and an umpire at every base, funny stories. Happy stories, sad stories, just plain baseball stories. The happiest story being the one about Willie May's very last at-bat in the minor leagues before he went up to the New York Giants and immortality. Well, it was old Grayson himself who had last crack at Mays in the ninth inning of a game with Indianapolis. And what did Grayson do? All he did was set the Say Hey Kid down swinging on three straight curveballs. The saddest story was the one about the scout who came down from the Toledo Munhens the mud Mudhens had a roster slot, and the scout had a notion to fill it with a pitcher with a wicked curveball, name of Earl Grayson. This was Grayson's big chance, for the mud hens were class triple A ball, one short step from the might majors. The night before the game, Grayson spent half of it on his knees by his bed, praying. And even five minutes before the game, in the dugout, he bent down, pretending to tie his shoe, and closed one eye and prayed, Please let me win this ball game which was something since he'd never gone to church in his life. God must have fainted, he said to Maniac. And indeed, maybe God did, or maybe he only listened to major leaguers, because Grayson took the mound and proceeded to pitch the flat-out, awfulest game of his life. His curveball wasn't curving. His sinker wasn't sinking. His knuckler wasn't knuckling. The batters were teeing off as if it were the invasion of Normandy Beach. Before the third inning was over, the score was twelve to nothing, and Grayson was in the showers. He was 27 years old then, and that was the closest he would ever get to the big show. He hung on for 13 more years, a baseball junkie, winding up in some hot tamale league in Guad Guadalajanto, Mexico, until his curveball could no longer bend around so much as a chili pepper, and his fastball was slower than a senorita's answer. He was 40, out of baseball, and for all intents and purposes, out of life. All those years in the game, and all he was fit to do was clean a restroom, or sweep a floor, or lay a chalk line. Or, far, far down the road, tell stories to a wide-eyed homeless kid. Chapter 26 It was impossible to listen to such stories empty-handed. As soon as Grayson started one, Maniac would reach into one of the equipment bags and pull out a ball or a bat or a catcher's mitt. Sniffing the scruffed horsehide aroma of the ball, rippling the fingertips over the red stitching, it's hard to say how these things can make the listening better, but they do. And for Maniac, they did. And of course, as happens with baseball, one thing led to another, and pretty soon the two of them were tossing a ball back and forth, and then they were outside, where the throws could be longer, where you could play pepper on the outfield grass of the legion field, the old man pitching and the kid tapping grounders, where you could shag fungos and the old man popping higher fly high flyers, the kid chasing them down. And now the stories were mixed with instruction, the grizzled rickety coot showing the kid how to spray liner to the opposite field how to get a jump on a long fly even before the batter hits it, how to throw the curve ball. Stiff, crooked fingers that grappled clumsily with crimpet wrappers curled naturally around the shape of a baseball. With a ball in his hand, the park handyman became a professor. As to the art of pitching, of course, the old man could show and tell, but he could no longer do, except for one pitch, the only one left in his repertoire from the old days. 
He called it the stop ball, and it nearly drove Maniac goofy. The old man claimed he discovered the stop ball one day down in the Texas League, and that he was long gone from baseball when he perfected it. Unlike most pitches, the stop ball involved no element of surprise. On the contrary, the old man would always announce it. Okay, he called in from the mound. Here she comes. Now keep your eye on her, because she's going to float on up there. And just about the time she's over the plate, she's going to stop. Now, nobody else ever hit it, so don't you go getting upset if you don't neither. It's no shame to whiff on the stop ball. And then he'd throw it. Well, of course, Manic knew that most, if not all, of that was blarney, and just to make sure, he watched the ball extra carefully. There sure didn't seem to be anything unusual about it, not at first anyway. But as the ball came closer, it did somehow seem to get more and more peculiar, and by the time it reached the plate, it might just as well have stopped, because Maniac never knew if he was swinging at the old man's pitch or at his speech. Whatever. In the weeks of trying, he never hit out of the infield. It was October. The trees rimming the outfield were flaunting their colors. The kid and the geezer baseballed their lunch times away and their after-dinner times and weekends. And every night as the old man left for his room at the Y, he would grouse, you ought to go back to school. And one night, the kids said back, I do. And that's how the old man found out what the kid was doing with his mornings. He had noticed the books before, rows and piles of them that kept growing. But there being books, he didn't think much of it. Now the kid tells him, you know the money you give me? Each morning he gave the kid 50 cents or a dollar to get himself some crimpins. Crimpins. Well, I take it up to the library. Right inside the door they have these books they're selling. Cases of them. All the books they don't want anymore. They only cost five or ten cents apiece, he pointed to the piles. I buy them. He showed them to the old man. Ancient, back-broken math books, flaking travel books, warped spellers, mangled mysteries, biographies, music books, astronomy books, cookbooks. What's the matter, said the old man. Can't you make up your mind what kind of you want? The kid laughed. I want them all. He threw his hands out. I'm learning everything. He opened one of the books. Look, geometry, triangles, okay, isosceles triangles, these two look these two legs they look equal to you the old man squinted he nodded okay but can you prove it the old man studied the triangle for a full minute if i had a ruler maybe no ruler the old man sighed guess i give up so the kid proved it absolutely dead center proved it two days later while playing pepper in the legion infield the old man said to the kid so why don't you go ahead and teach me how to read <laughs>